blast you, technology! Hello everyone, I am history professor Jared Frederick, and welcome to a short episode of Real History that will, I hope, be a very nice supplement to our uh, series that was examining HBO's miniseries Band of Brothers. Uh, we're really, really pleased with all of the feedback and all of the, the support and commentary uh, that we've gotten from you, our viewers, uh, about this this Hallmark production that, that came out well over 20 years ago now. And uh, we thought we would build upon that by uh, extenuating that discussion. And a lot of questions that we have been receiving are, you know, where do you get your information? Uh, what else would you recommend in regard to reading about Easy Company, the 101st Airborne, paratroopers in the Second World War? And suffice it to say, uh, there are mountains of literature, uh, primary and secondary sources that talk about these various subject matters. Uh, tonight, though, what I'm going to do is I'll be sharing with you um, some of my favorite sources and some of my books that I used uh, in regard to uh, how I came up with the commentary for the Band of Brothers episodes here on Real History. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a very casual walkthrough about some of the literature that is out there and what it has to offer in regard to the Band of Brothers saga. Uh, and naturally, the obvious book to start with um, is uh, Stephen Ambrose's 1992 book for which the series is named Band of Brothers. For as iconic as a book this is, it'd be really, really difficult for a historian now to write this because at the, the center of this book is individual stories that were told to author Stephen Ambrose himself. The men of Easy Company had annual reunions. Uh, he was uh, accepted into that fold. Uh, Major Dick Winters was the, the primary person who was responsible for facilitating Stephen Ambrose becoming involved because Winters had a very good sense that there was a good story to be told in the tales of he and his men. And uh, in the early 1990s, Stephen Ambrose was a, a rising star, very popular uh, among uh, historical readers. Uh, and uh, sure enough, the 50th anniversary of the Second World War is one of the things that uh, allowed that popularity to surge. Um, and one of the really interesting things about the, the book Band of Brothers is it wasn't originally the inspiration that Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg initially went after. Uh, following the popularity of Saving Private Ryan, um, Steven Spielberg had initially thought of turning a miniseries out of Stephen Ambrose's work, Citizen Soldiers. Uh, Tom Hanks informed Steven Spielberg that the, the far better option um, that would be a lot more unique uh, would be turning this book into a miniseries. Uh, because I never really before had anything like that been done so in depth, follow a core group of soldiers and characters from one end of the war to the next. And the rest, they say, is history. There are many, many uh, memoirs and biographies about uh, soldiers who were in Easy Company in the 101st Airborne during the Second World War. Um, these are e easily found online. Um, some authors who, who really I excel at this um, include Marcus Brotherton, um, who has written a number of books about Easy Company. Uh, Larry Alexander um, is another, uh, both of whom have been very helpful and, and supportive in my, my own research um, on this topic. Um, another uh, author who was uh, very, very close with major winners uh, was himself uh, an officer in the United States Army, and his name was Cole Kingseed. And uh, Cole Kingseed co-wrote uh, Dick Winter's memoirs, which came out uh, just a few years after the, the HBO series did. Um, but a number of years later, um, Kingseed uh, penned uh, the equally revealing Conversations with Major Dick Winters. 
Um, and in some ways, I, I enjoy this book even more than the memoir itself. Um, it is uh, very accessible. It gets into the, the themes of leadership. Um, it, it's, it's a reminiscence that this colonel had with major winners in his latter years. Um, and it just it shows the value of friendship, trying to learn as much as possible from your friends. Um, and, and even more so, it shows this army officer trying to squeeze as much pertinent information out of this iconic World War II leader as is humanly possible. Um, so uh, Conversations with Major Dick Winters, it's a very intimate look at this uh, very notable combat leader uh, who came to lead EZ Company and the battalion that it was in. A very revealing passage in conversations with Major Dick Winters um, is this part right here, uh, where Colonel Kingseed asked Dick, did you personally experience fear? Did fear ever grip your outfit? To which Winters responded, I suspect every soldier at one time or another experiences a degree of fear. Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the willingness to rise above fear and do the things that you know need to be accomplished. All soldiers hope that they will measure up the first time that they get into a fight. I certainly was no exception, but I believe I had prepared myself very well that once I came under fire, I instinctively knew what needed to be done. And I think that is so revealing because it demonstrates this sublime confidence that Major Winters had throughout the war. Um, he put uh, the, the notion of you know, his personal safety, any personal danger that he may have encountered, that was all of secondary concern to him. The most important thing to him was the efficiency of his outfit, making sure that they were fit and limber in battle, and trying to get as many of his men out of there as possible while also achieving victory. There are some great conversations to be had in this book. Uh, one of the most cherished books in my collection uh, is, is the book Parachute Infantry, uh, which was written by David Webster, uh, one of the, the veterans of EZ Company, and he was portrayed by actor Ian Bailey. Um, in the series, and uh, he gets a, a lot of notable screen time in some of the, the latter episodes um, of the series. And um, this has been uh, a book that has been uh, published in uh, both uh, large paperback and in mass market paperback. And uh, by and large, the mass market paperback is the one that is readily available today. Um, and it, it's not this book in and of itself that, it, that is unique. Um, but rather, it was the person who previously owned uh, this specific copy um, because uh, this copy was actually from, as the book plate would show, the library of Major Dick Winters himself. Definitely, definitely one of my most prized possessions in my historical collection. As we take some historical books into consideration, that is to say, uh, books that are actually from the 1940s, uh, one that I uh, mentioned in uh, one of our episodes of Band of Brothers um, is actually this West Point yearbook. It's entitled The Howitzer. This is an original copy from 1944. And what makes it so unique is that it's, it's not an easy company book per se, uh, but one of the replacement officers who graduated on June 6, 1944, along with Dwight Eisenhower's son, John, uh, was none other than Henry Sweet Jones, who in the series is portrayed by Tom Hanks's son, Colin. And what I, what I love about the, the, the excerpt within this yearbook is that it offers a very sort of intimate perspective of this this minor yet important character who we find in the series. And uh, his nickname was Honez, H-O-N-E-Z. And this is what his fellow classmates had to say about Jones. Honez preferred to gain most of his education outside the academic course through his diligent study of men and books. His knowledge of tactics, firearms, and judo, as well as his open, inquisitive mind will enable him to become a valuable and resourceful officer. 
His companions will always know him as an original thinker and a sincere and unselfish friend. Um, and so these are, you know, insights from the era that we won't be able to necessarily find in, you know, post-war memoirs and reminiscences or anything like that. And when you look at a book like this, uh, sometimes it's helpful to recognize that sometimes you just have to go back straight to the source from the war years themselves. Another one of my favorite books associated with this acclaimed outfit is the Regimental Scrapbook of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, uh, which is simply entitled Currahy. Um, sometimes you can find these uh, in uh, original copies uh, that were printed in Germany right at the end of the Second World War as uh, the regiment was uh, involved in its various occupation duties. Uh, but there are also reproductions, very high quality reproductions that are available out there on the secondary market. And there are all sorts of wonderful insights to be found in this unit scrapbook. And among my favorite parts of it is uh, the introduction that was written by Colonel Robert Sink right at the beginning of the book. Uh, and it says, officers and men of the regiment, it is the intent to reproduce herein a pictorial representation of what you've done in fighting this war. The scrapbook has its genesis in the activation of the regiment on 20 July 1942. It will cover your training, your fighting, your play. Its exodus is to be that day when the last man of the 506th makes his final jump and becomes himself eternal in the heavens. And sadly enough, here we are over 75 years later after the end of World War II, and I'm sad to say that we're getting closer and closer to that day where there won't be any men of the 506th left. As you page through this book, you, you can recognize all sorts of familiar uh, names and episodes and places uh, from the series itself. Uh, but perhaps my single favorite page in the book is a, a scrapbook page of all of the company commanders within the regiment. And uh, almost all of them are shown in their, their spit and polish Class A jackets and Ike uniforms. Uh, but one very notable exception, an officer who is portrayed in an entirely different manner in comparison to all of his other comrades is none other than Ronald C. Spears, uh, the sometimes mysterious and very much iconic commander of Easy Company, who was the longest serving commander of Easy Company from January of 1945 until well beyond the end of the war as the 506 was involved in its occupation duties in Germany. On this page, we can see that Spears is not dressed up in his Class A's or anything like that. He is in his M1942 uniform during the Battle of the Bulge, two hand grenades clipped to his chest pockets, captured German binoculars wrapped around his neck and a Thompson submachine gun in his hands. What else do you need to know about Ronald Spears beyond that? I take that back. There's a lot more to learn about Ronald Spears and you can learn more about it in my forthcoming book entitled Fierce Valor, the true story of Ronald Spears and his band of brothers co-authored with my good friend Eric Dorr now available for order online. And in that book, we will get to the heart of some of the most uh, mysterious and, and questionable and inspiring episodes that defined that iconic officer. In the meantime, until you can order that book, you can also check out my other book as well. This is a book that I, I plugged frequently um, in the series. It's Hang Tough, and it looks at the World War II letters and artifacts of Major Dick Winters. There's all sorts of really great insights that can be found within this book. And if I ever get to meet you in person, I'll be happy to autograph it for you. Uh, moving away a bit from Easy Company itself, we can also gain all sorts of really fascinating insights about uh, other regiments within the division, other battalions in the division, and the story of the division itself throughout the war and beyond. There are many, many memoirs, as I said, 
Um, and, and a lesser known one that is a little bit newer than, than all the rest um, is simply called Nuts. To the German commander, Nuts. And the, the subtitle for it is a 101st Airborne Division machine gunner at Bastogne. Uh, this was authored by Vincent Speranza, um, who is, uh, at the time that we are filming this, uh, is still alive. He's very active in veterans affairs. Um, I've met him on a number of occasions. Um, he, he travels the world. He still jumps out of airplanes. Um, and in so many ways, uh, he embodies that, that iconic airborne creed of, of the Second World War. Um, just a really outgoing guy, always anxious to tell the story of he and his men. And so many of those stories are featured in this book, wonderfully entitled, Nuts. Uh, one of the, the really spectacular World War II historians who's out there today is uh, John C. McManus. And uh, he has written fantastic books about the, the Big Red One on, on Omaha Beach, um, these, these broader overview histories about the GI combat experience in World War II. Um, but one of his really excellent airborne studies uh, is called September Hope. And that looks at the American side of A Bridge Too Far. This is a book that analyzes uh, Operation Market Garden with uh, really just excellent precision and scholarship. And uh, it adds on to Cornelius Ryan's book, A Bridge Too Far, and many of you have undoubtedly seen the movie that we will definitely analyze here on Real History at some point. Um, but he brings so many of these stories that were left out of previous works to life, uh, and he shows the dynamics very effectively of uh, where the Americans succeeded, where they failed, and how they compared and contrasted uh, with the, the overlapping efforts of uh, British forces during this ill-fated airborne operation in September of 1944. Um, more recently, McManus uh, has been writing books about the United States Army and its various campaigns in the Pacific theater of war, uh, which he argues has always been overlooked. And in many ways, he is trying to revive the significance that the Army played in the Pacific Theater. So check out that book as well. Another top-notch scholar who uh, really has a firm grasp of airborne history in the Second World War uh, is a historian by the name of Ian Gardner. And he has written an excellent trilogy about 3rd Battalion in the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, a more recent book, though, that, that dovetails on that um, is a really nice illustrated book. Uh, that looks into 3rd Battalion. It has some overlapping characters here and there uh, from Band of Brothers. Uh, but, you know, it, it too, in the same way that Band of Brothers does, it, it gets into the mindset of these airborne paratroopers. Uh, what motivated them? Their combat experiences. There's some excellent maps and first-hand accounts to be found in this book. And in many ways, it's a, it's a condensed version of his trilogy uh, that, that just has uh, a lot more graphics and photos in it. So uh, whether you check out this book or the three previous books themselves, you won't be let down. One of the masterworks covering 101st Airborne Division history in the Second World War is a book called Rendezvous with Destiny. Um, and it's, uh, as you could see, um, a, a very thick book. And uh, it was written by 101st Airborne veterans, Leonard Rapport and Arthur Norwood, uh, right after the war. And uh, what makes it so unique in comparison to a lot of other 101st books, um, it's kind of written in first person. Um, you know, it, it, it uses we a lot uh, in this narrative. Um, and so there's a real sense of uh, immediacy uh, to the story. You can tell that, uh, that a lot of the tales therein are uh, of recent memory, uh, relatively speaking. And uh, it's, it's just an excellent division history. Um, and it really gets into some of the, the fine details of these campaigns, these actions. Uh, and it, it introduced me to people and places uh, that, that in nowhere are mentioned in Band of Brothers, the, the book, or the series. You know, what were the other regiments in the 101st doing during Operation Market Garden? I had no idea prior to reading this book. Uh, and so 
Uh, this book's a little bit harder to find. It is out of print, but you can find it on the secondary market, and hopefully sometime in the future it will be republished. Uh, but it, it's a truly excellent book. The binding on mine is falling apart because of how extensively I've used it in my own research. Also within my collections is a, a fine illustrated book, which is entitled Easy Company in Photographs. Um, and, and this is a rather rarer book. Uh, it is uh, printed by Genesis Publications. And uh, it just has so many great, absolutely phenomenal first-hand accounts about men in Easy Company. There are document inserts. There are rare photographs. There are company rosters. There's some of Dick Winter's correspondence. Um, it, it's just a really rich compendium of stories of this acclaimed company. And there is also some insight by some of the actors and producers associated with uh, the HBO series. Um, this one too is, is out of print and it's sometimes even harder and more expensive to come across. Um, but if you are a true aficionado of Band of Brothers, uh, this is one book that definitely has to be on your shelf. That wraps up this special episode of Real History. Uh, we hope that the, the bibliography offered here to you uh, has been helpful. We hope that it has introduced you to some new titles uh, related to Band of Brothers that you may have not been familiar with. And, you know, this level of research, you know, reading about the past, reading these firsthand accounts, learning the stories of the men of Easy Company, and also the subject matters of other historical films as well, it's what allows you, the viewer, to be able to decipher fact from fiction. And the information that you can find is sometimes surprising, it's sometimes shocking, uh, but I really enjoy reading these books. My books are my prized possession, and they go hand in hand with our understandings of how cinema portrays the past. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Real History.